um, and that lovely reminder to lift our eyes to our beautiful Saviour. So what a joy it is to be able to praise our great God together again um, after so, uh, so long not being able to do that um, together. So for those of you who are here in Nottingham, um, you might have already had a wee look at the bookstall in the foyer. Um, for those of you watching online, never fear, there's, um, there's also an opportunity for you to pick up um, the same convention discounts uh, by going to the website. Um, that's www.tenofthose.com forward slash MWC. Um, one thing I love about coming to events like this is getting great recommendations of what to add to my reading list. So we're going to welcome Rob onto the stage now to tell us what the lovely Ten of Those team have brought for us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Have you noticed the bookstall? <laughs> Excellent. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with some recommendations. Um, good reading for you. If you don't know where to start, here are a couple of great books to begin with. Um, the first will be Jen Wilkins' new book is out, Ten Words to Live By. This is a real refreshing new look at the Ten Commandments and how valuable they are in the life of a Christian. As you know, Jen writes really well uh, in, in these bite-sized chapters that you'll be able to either read along with somebody else. I recommend it. It's a new look at the Ten Commandments, really about Christ-likeness and the coming kingdom of God. That's eight pounds. Um, Helen's book, of course, um, Hope in an Anxious World, just three pounds in the bookstore. These are six, six lies that anxiety will tell us and six gospel truths to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and a really um, accessible read either for yourself if you've got a, a non-Christian friend as well who you think might be open to some biblical ideas um, in tackling anxiety which is so common in our world just three pounds there um, on to some thoughts for you for devotion Devotion is so valuable that we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We behold him and we are transformed. And um, Captivated by Christ by Richard Chin. Uh, this is about seeing Jesus clearly in the book of Colossians. So if you've been encouraged today by looking at Colossians and you would like to take that back home with you, maybe read a little deeper, spend some time uh, just soaking in God's word. Um, it's just five pounds here, Captivated by Christ. Richard Chin, and um, we've also got our undated devotions here, which you'll see, which can lead you through the book of Colossians as well, but I really recommend this one to you. He's a pastor and uh, a really great writer. Um, good. Now then, it's not that long, 11 weeks. <laughs> it's Christmas. Now remember, Christmas, that's our thing, isn't it? That's, that's our thing, and... Um, uh, you know, it might be tricky to do evangelism, you might find it hard, but Christmas is the best opportunity because that's our thing, the door's open, so you can uh, buy some books for a pound, you can drop them through letterboxes and run away, uh, how it, you can leave them just on the bus seat that you happen to be on. Um, a new small Christmas book out. This is an evangelistic book for adults. It's a very merry Christmas, very messy Christmas rather, um, by Jay Gowen. We have a number of uh, different one of these from across the years. They're just a pound. I recommend you just pick up uh, maybe five and challenge yourself to give them away. Uh, of course, children's books are a great way to. Um, get the gospel into the minds of their parents as well. So you give a child a book. Uh, don't just go around giving random children books. But uh, if, if you happen to know their parents as well, maybe give them a children's book. Um, we've got a lot of one-pound books. The Longest Wait is still my favorite by far, uh, just a pound. And uh, you may know that our um, own series, uh, these are the Every Child series, and the latest is called The Bible Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a hardback book. It's um, going through Old and New Testament stories in a really um, interesting and um, accessible way for children, but also lots of lovely pictures in there. It's a great gift at Christmas, so if you really like somebody, it's £12 for the every Bible story a child should know. And finally, Advent. Advent, I find, is a real guilt-free way to get back into devotions. 
maybe at home, maybe your family devotions or uh, just even devotions by yourself have uh, maybe suffered and you think what would be a good time and a good way to get back into devotions. Uh, There's a new book called Finding Hope Under Bethlehem Skies, uh, a really interesting um, way through Advent, weaving the book of Ruth into Advent. And it's just two pounds um, if you're looking to get uh, another devotional and maybe focus towards Christmas with either just yourself or with friends or family. That's a good way to do it. Did I say finally before? Because what I really meant is finally now. These are Advent activity books. One is a storybook going through Advent, and the other, for every day of Advent, there's an activity, and I don't know if you can see those, but there's something to cut out and colour in, um, something to build, and a little um, decoration with a scripture on it. If you have children, if there are children in your world um, in any way, I'd really recommend these two. I think they're five pounds and three pounds separately, but you can buy them both for just five pounds today. How's that? Have you remembered all those? I'll be testing you when you come to the bookstore. Thank you so much. We'll see you just in the foyer. Thanks so much, Rob. That's some great recommendations. I hope everyone's got their um, credit cards with them today. Um, We are going to sing together again uh, the song King of Kings, and after that, Abby's going to come and lead us in prayer. Um, This is a song that talks of how God has rescued us from darkness through what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. What amazing freedom we have to be able to praise such a saviour together. So let's stand if you're able and sing together. In the darkness we were waiting without hope so from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dust.
please do take a seat. Um, I'm Abby, and um, before Helen comes back up to speak to us in the second session, um, I'm going to read again from Colossians, um, and, then, and then I'm going to pray for us. Um, so this reading is from Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 1 and to verse 17. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 17. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such evil things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and in the image image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let me pray um, as Helen comes up to speak. Father, we are so thankful for the gospel. Thank you for your word that lets us know how we can be saved and that Jesus came to shed his blood to reconcile us to you. We thank you for revealing yourself to us in the Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would help us to live a wholehearted life as a result of our salvation. We know that we can't do it on our own. And we pray for Helen now as she comes um, to help us understand these words, that you would speak through her, um, giving us um, wisdom that will help us to live wholeheartedly for you. Amen. Well, I'm going to let you into a little bit of a secret. I have no discernible sense of direction. It doesn't matter where I am or where I'm going, I am going to be lost. My previous job, uh, I had an itinerant role just around London, and every day I needed to be in a different part of London. And for basically the first 18 months, my Facebook status could quite happily have said, somewhere in London, not quite sure where. I usually know roughly where I am, and I, I usually know roughly where I want to get to. But the way those two things connect is a bit of a mystery. Maps do not help. I have no idea which way to hold them up. Google Maps 
do not help. You know that little blue dot with that little, I can never work out which way I'm facing. Instructions never help because I never seem to have enough signal and when it says turn left, that's what I should have done two meters back and I'm now ready to turn right. I need rescuing. More to the point, I need showing where to go. And it can be a bit like that in, in the Christian life as well. It can be a bit like that in what we were looking at this morning. Maybe having reflected after this morning's talk, you, you know that maybe you're not being as wholehearted as you want to be, not being as wholehearted uh, as God is calling you to be. Maybe you've got that sense of awareness. Maybe you know you're leaning that little bit towards works or leaning that little bit towards experience or, or division. Uh, and you know that that is your starting point, but not your destination. Uh, and maybe you can see, maybe you've glimpsed a little of how wonderful it would be to be living that wholehearted Christian life, so rooted in that beautiful gospel that it just flows out of you, so excited about Jesus that your heart is full of praise, so, so confident in Jesus that you, you're able to face the pressures of each day, so uh, overwhelmed with Jesus that he is molding and making every aspect of your life. Maybe you can see the beauty of where you would like to go. But if we just know where we are and where we'd like to be, but not the bit in the middle, there's a danger in our Christian life. We can just end up wandering aimlessly, trying to work out how to get to the wholehearted life. And if we do that, we probably end up just doing a few more works or looking for a few more experiences, if we haven't got a clear sense of how to get to where we're going, we'll just end up doing more of what we're doing already. Thankfully, Paul, in his wisdom, inspired by the Lord as he wrote these words, knew that people like us would have struggles like that. And in intensely practical ways, in chapter three of Colossians, Paul takes us on a roadmap helping us to understand not only where we're going, but how we're to do that journey. Or come with me, if you will, on a journey of discovery of how we move from wherever we are, loved, but maybe not quite where we need to be, to a place of flourishing, of wholeheartedness, of beauty, of purpose, and of passion. Well, first of all, Let's map out where it's going in Colossians 3. First of all, Paul gives us a little bit of a kind of a mode of travel. He, he tells us what kind of mindset we want to be in as we're going on this journey. Then he gives us a lot about the route, what we need to be doing as we go through this process of change to become more hard-hearted. And then he goes on to giving us some quick scenes, things that we should see as we go on that process of becoming more hard-hearted. And he ends up with a wonderful uh, conclusion. So let's look at those things uh, one at a time and see where we go. So first of all, our hearts, a clear perspective. We want to be people who understand this mode of travel, who have our eyes set in the right place. I mean, we understand that about travel, don't we? I mean, a number of you will have driving licenses. I'm pretty sure you've got the concept of you should be looking out of your windscreen whilst you're moving. Eyes closed, not a good idea. Casually wandering around, never going to end well. We know that where we have our eyes when we're traveling is important. Even for those of us who don't drive uh, like me, having our eyes in the right place is important. Uh, when I got off at Nottingham Station uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, I, I was using my eyes greatly to try and find some kind of board that would tell me what trains leave from which platform. Never found it. If anyone knows Nottingham Station well, do give me the hint. But it's important to have our eyes set in the right place so we know where we're going. Uh, and Paul says our eyes, uh, our, our minds, uh, they need to be on Christ. So first of all, uh, verse one of chapter three. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. 
Paul assumes his readers are people that are recipients of grace, people who are already living uh, with the benefits of the cross, people who know what it is to have a risen saviour, one who is ruling and reigning and interceding for them in heaven. And he's saying, if you want to go on this journey towards standing firm, being wholehearted for Christ, then actually seeing him as our ruler and the one that is reigning is important. Much of the Christian life is a joy, but there's also a sense that it's a right duty as well. Now, I don't mean duty in the sense of something that drags us down and feels like drudgery, not that kind of duty, but a sense that it's actually just right to make Jesus number one, to acknowledge him as our king, because that is who he is. And if, as we were looking at in our first session, we have our eyes firmly fixed on him, we see that rightness more and more. I don't know how you do your quiet times. Uh, Rob was giving us lots of ideas of how we could do them. But one thing I would encourage us to do, at least sometimes, is not to do our quiet times too quickly. Not for it to be a tick box exercise, not read passage, prayed prayer, done, moving on to breakfast. But to be something that encourages us to keep our eyes on Christ and to dwell in his glory. To allow our hearts to be moved by how big he is to allow our minds to be expanded by the the greatness of his rule, to be bowled over by the fact that he not only knows how many hairs we've got on our head and how many of them are gray, not only knows every thought that is going through our hearts, he is doing that for every human being on earth. He is keeping every planet in the solar system spinning. He knows the exact angle that every star is tilting. When you look at a beautiful mountain scene, do you know that he knows the number of blades of grass? He knows how much that stone has moved over the last 2,000 years. This is our God. See that rule, see that power, and allow your heart to be moved by it and know that he is so much bigger than us. That it just makes sense that we put him first. This isn't little God that we can take or leave. This is the God who is the only reason our heart is beating, our lungs are breathing in air, uh, that we're able to sit in a chair, that we're able to think and feel and be. He is rightly worthy of our all. When we see him face to face at, at those final days, we will be sinking to our knees in awe and there's a sense that we want that feeling now. Obeying him, being wholehearted for him, it is right. But it's not, it's not just a duty. If we go to verse 2, we will see that we want our minds set on Christ as well. Uh, because actually, when we have our minds on heavenly things rather than earthly things, when we get our priorities right, it's actually an expedient way of living. It, it works, Christianity. It's right because he's king, but also having our minds set on eternity, on him in heaven, rather than everything that's flurrying on now, is the way that life just makes sense. It's so easy, isn't it, to get distracted by what's going on in the here and now. How many of us have got half a mind on what's going on back home? What's happening to the kids, or the flatmate, or the husband, or the house? Or, or, or that bit of work that we need to do. Or, or something that we're due to do at church tomorrow and haven't quite prepped yet. Or on the fact that life hurts. Or that we're feeling down or anxious and that negative thoughts are flooding our mind. That there's a pressure that we know is coming next week. That there's a decision that we know we need to make about our health or maybe caring for someone we love. And all those things are important. It is not that they don't matter. It is not that we ignore those things But they're not the thing that frames our life. Our pain, our problems, our joys, our struggles, our our distractions, our responsibilities are here. And and around it, above it, is the glory of God and his purposes for our life. Maybe you are feeling anxious. Maybe you are feeling down. Maybe you are feeling distracted. He encourages to lift our eyes, not to ignore our problems, but to see Christ's supremacy over them, to know his purposes for us in them, 
to see his leading of us through them. This is the God who has eternal things in mind. I often uh, think back to the story of Joseph. Do you remember the story of Joseph? It's not quite a Colossians thing, a bit of a detail here, I know, but Joseph is one of those people that, I mean, how could he not be distracted by what was happening to him? Remember the story, hated by his brothers, uh, almost murdered, but then just sold into slavery, which of course is way better. He gets trafficked to a foreign land, sold as a slave, ends up working in a house where the wife is incredibly immoral, gets accused of a crime he didn't commit, uh, get thrown into prison for a crime he didn't commit, uh, made a couple of friends, uh, one of whom died, but one of whom probably forgot him, uh, stayed a bit longer in prison, uh, probably presumably feeling very lonely and betrayed by the friend uh, who forgot him. Uh, then got out of prison to do what must have felt like an impossible task, standing before the most important person in that land, Uh, managed to do that task with God's help and then got given the job of managing a massive famine relief program for an entire nation and all the surrounding nations for seven years plus. Stressed? (laughs) If anyone had reason to be distracted by the here and now, it's Joseph. But do you remember what he says at the end of his story to his brothers? What you intended for evil, God intended for good. And that is the kind of feeling, uh, maybe, potentially, even Paul was thinking of stories like that as he was writing these verses. Don't get distracted by the here and now. Yes, it's important. Yes, pray about it. Yes, talk about it with your friends. Don't, Don't be stoics that pretend the hard stuff isn't happening. But lift your eyes. Know that there is purpose and beauty going on above the pain. To go on this journey, we need to have um, our hearts that are set on Christ, knowing that it's right to put him first. We need to have lives that are hearts and minds that are orientated to Christ, convinced that his ways are better than our ways. And we need to have lives that are passionate about Christ. See that in verses three and four? For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ is, you are life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. We're called to have a heavenly perspective too. You know, whatever is happening now, and I know for some of you what is happening now is deeply painful. It's not always going to be like this. We can put Jesus first. We can be wholehearted for him because he's the one that's going to bring an end to all the tough stuff and usher in perfection on that day that he comes back. I don't know when that's going to be, arguably before I begin finish this talk, uh, but possibly not. And there's going to be a moment where we are not sitting in rows in Cornerstone Church on the glorious multicolored chairs, but we are going to be standing around the throne, Jesus at the center, him as our light, praising him for the whole of eternity. Our relationship with him will be perfect. Our relationship with each other will be perfect. There will be no more sin. Can you imagine the glory of opening your mouth and knowing nothing stupid is going to come out? It is going to be a wonderful day. But also knowing that nothing will hurt us. No more pain, no more grieving, no more death. That is where we're heading. There's no such thing as an unhappy ending for those who are in Christ. And he's saying as we travel, as we travel for the mess and the muddle where we are towards wholeheartedness and standing firm in Christ, let's have that mindset that Jesus is worth it, that his life works, and that this is just a temporary moment before glory comes. And if we have our eyes set there, if we're seeing that clearly, then all that follows becomes so much more possible. Well, what does follow? After a clear perspective, a transforming life, he maps out how we are to change the steps to take from here to here, from muddle and slight leaning away from the gospel to wholeheartedness and standing firm. And the first thing that he notes in verses 5 to 11 is that sense of taking off, of killing our old self. It's quite strong language, isn't it? Kill. It's not the sort of thing that us nice Christian gentle ladies tend to say to each other uh, very often. 
Uh, and of course, it's not advocating violence or anything like that uh, within us or in the wider world. But there's that sense in which we are to genuinely hate and want to move away from the things that are holding us back from being wholehearted. Now, now, please let me nuance that for anyone that might have heard that through a lens uh, of anxiety or depression. That is not hating ourselves. God loves us. God delights in us. We are in his image. We are precious. He he adores to hear us. Self-hatred is not part of the Christian life. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. But the stuff that is stopping us from becoming like Jesus, the stuff that is taking these clean robes of righteousness that he has given us and is splattering them with mud and ketchup and mustard and all the other stuff uh, that goes into our hearts, metaphorically speaking. That stuff we're called to hate and to want to go away. You see, when Jesus died and rose again for us, he already took away our old self. That has actually gone. But we so often keep going back to it. Maybe something's happened in your past and you feel dirty. But God has made you clean, but something inside you just goes, I'm I'm sure I'm still dirty. And so you act like someone that is tainted. Maybe you've been desperately hurt or betrayed in the past and, and Jesus has brought comfort into your life. But it's still so much easier to, to lash out in pain when we feel somebody might want to hurt us again. There's a whole host of things in our past. Maybe behaviors, maybe addictions, maybe old patterns of behaving, kinds of relationships that we used to get into. They're there, and Jesus has dealt with them. He's washed it away, but part of our brain keeps going, but no, no, maybe that is still me. Maybe, maybe that's who I truly am. And Paul is saying, kill off your old self. Kill off the stuff that you used to do. Get rid of it. It is not beautiful. It is not good for you. It is not what's going to help you flourish. It is like chains holding you down. Get rid of them and be free and come and be the person that God has called you to be. Well, he gives us quite a list And while probably most of us won't be ticking everything on this list, I'm sure all of us will be ticking something. What are the kind of things that are part of our earthly nature that that God wants us to get rid of, that Jesus has already dealt with and we just need to be moving away from? Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. A little later on, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips, lies. Can you see some of your old self there? Can you see some of that in your heart? For some of us, it'll be killing off some of our behaviors. For some of us, there will be people here steeped in sexual immorality right now. And I'm not saying that with any kind of foreknowledge or prophecy. You're just a group of 150 women. And statistics suggest that it's going to be real for some of us. Others of us are going to be dealing with greed. We want stuff. We desperately want what other people have got, whether that's the house or the car or the qualifications or the prestige. Maybe it's the power or the respect. We desire. We desire things deeply. For others of us, it'll be the way that we use our words. Maybe not the way we use our words on a Sunday morning. Oh, don't we morph into somebody desperately polite on a Sunday morning? But when we're alone, at home, and we've just put the phone down from that really irritating phone call, what are your words like then? When nobody else sees, when nobody else hears, and you're just talking about somebody else, maybe someone that genuinely has hurt you, are your words kind then? Mine aren't. There's nothing like preparing a talk on Colossians to bring you face to face with how your heart has been this week. God says, let's take off those actions. Let's take off those desires that have gone wayward. Let's not be those people anymore. Now, that sounds big, doesn't it? 
I mean, that does sound huge. Let's take off all the behaviors that are not fitting to God. I remember a campaign that Boots the Chemist did ages ago, Change One Thing. And I think, I think Paul and the Bible and, and God generally have that sense of just start somewhere. Progressive sanctification is meant to be just that, progressive. It's not that we come to the Nottingham uh, Cornerstone Church for the Midland Women's Convention, hear a talk on Colossians, and suddenly we're all wholehearted. This is about taking the next baby step. Think about one thing in your life that's going astray. One area of greed or impurity or lust or, or lying or anger or rage or slander. One thing. And commit yourself to catching that thing and killing it. What does that look like? Uh, it doesn't look like harsh treatment of ourselves. It says elsewhere uh, that harsh treatment of the body is not what the Christian life is about. So this isn't about an ascetic, be down on yourself, beat yourself up when you get it wrong kind of mindset. That's not Christianity at all. What it means to kill our old self is to, to take those uh, moments when we're going astray and to catch them and to actively turn around. So maybe it goes uh, something like this. Oh, my boss is such an idiot. I won't comment on whether I uttered those words or not this week. I'll leave that entirely to your imagination. I love my boss dearly. Just want to put that out there for the record. Oh, my boss is such an idiot. And we just catch ourselves. I go, oh, Lord, I am so sorry. That's my old self speaking. That, that's, that's anger speaking. That is, that is my desires getting out of control. Lord, I'm, I'm sorry for that ugliness. Help me to say something beautiful. Lord, thank you for my boss. He's fallible, I'm fallible, but I am so grateful to God for him. And then we do that every time for the next 38 years while we're practicing. <laughs> because this is not a one and done thing. This is about us gradually changing in the power of the Spirit, fueled by verses like this. But it's catching those things, not letting them ride, repenting of those things, turning around, confident that the Lord loves to forgive us. It's not that when he sees those things of malice and rage and anger and lust that he's sitting up in heaven going, oh my goodness, here they go again. That is like the 38th time Helen has said that today and I am just fed up. That's not our God. This is the God that goes, Helen, come on. That's your old self. Come on, come to the new. You want to? Oh, praise God. Ah, oh, yes, you're forgiven. You are so forgiven. I'm lavishing you with grace. Come to something better. Come on. I'm at work in you. I'm enabling you to do this. Come to something more beautiful. That is the God we have. Let's be passionate about taking off that old self, about killing that old self, one baby step at a time, about becoming the person that God wants us to be by noticing, by repenting, by reading by reorientating just one tiny thing. And as we do that, we'll find gradually we get practiced. And gradually I just say, praise God for my boss. He is such a joy and a delight. And on those moments where we disagree, thank you that iron sharpens iron. And I can pick the next thing and work on that. Believe me, you're not going to run out of stuff, so pace yourself. We can keep going little bit by little bit throughout our lives and gradually take off our old self and become the new. Does it sound daunting? Well, allow yourself to revel a little bit in the verse in the middle. What some of you were. This is what you used to be like. You used to walk in these ways, it says in verse 7. See, these Christians have already seen change. They already have evidence that God is doing this work in their lives. They already know that the Holy Spirit is changing them as they put to death the old. And that is evidence that God is going to keep doing that because the Holy Spirit's not going anywhere. The call isn't going anywhere. God doesn't give up on his children. And so they are able to go and we are able to go on that journey of change towards wholeheartedness. 
When I was younger, I used to like walking up mountains. Now I prefer sitting on the sofa. But in my youth, I, I used to love that mountain walk. I used to love that point halfway. And at that point, you had a choice. You could either look up and go, oh my goodness me, I've got to go up there. That looks really hard and rocky and high and I'm already tired. Or you can look back down and go, wow, we've climbed so far. Look at how far we've come. This has been an exciting journey. My goodness me, I I never thought I'd get this far. This is great. Let's do that with our Christian life too. Sometimes we need to look up and go, okay, Lord, we need to keep pressing on with this sanctification and holiness thing. I've got a way to go. But often we need to look back and go, wow, Lord, you've changed me so much. I am not the person I was 10 years ago. Thank you. And let that spur you on to keep killing the old, to putting off the old and pursuing the new. The second thing in verses 12 to 15 is putting on our our new self. And and you see how Paul motivates us. Again, it's not uh, by kind of some stoic pull yourself together. Paul is not there going, for goodness sake, Jesus died for you. Will you just get on with being holy? I am fed up with you flapping around in sin. Get it together. No. As God's chosen people, you're set apart You're handpicked for his family. 20,000 years ago, your name was on his heart. And he knew he wanted you in his family. He has died for you. He is living in you. He has brought you into intimacy with him. And in that context where you have been washed clean, where you are dearly loved, delighted in, adored, In that context of gentleness and hope and Christ's sufficient work, having already started that process of killing off the old, turn to something beautiful. And isn't that list beautiful? It's a list that combines personal qualities with a corporate community feel, but a list of compassion, kindness, Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, loving one another in unity. That's what wholeheartedness looks like. It's not some kind of freaky Bible bashing, wearing really odd clothes, standing on a street corner doing something really weird. That's not what wholeheartedness looks like. Wholeheartedness is a heart that is for Jesus, a, a heart that is committed to killing off the old, and a heart that is full of compassion and kindness, gentleness and love. Does that sound like a good life to go towards? We can pursue that together. Putting on the new self. It's like changing our clothes as we take off the old, as we repent, as we read, as we reorientate. We can actively then start articulating and living in ways which are beautiful. When we get it wrong, when we're grumpy with our husband, our boyfriend, our brother, our father, uh, and we can just say, sorry, Lord, for that. Help me to Help me to revel in your kindness. Help me to see your kindness in my life. Help me to emulate that kindness in my life. And we can turn around and we can try again with that relationship and go, Lord, I'm really sorry. You know, friend, I'm really sorry that I yelled at you for leaving your socks on the floor. It felt in that moment as if that sock was an act of war. But I love you. And I want to learn to love you more. Let's pray together that we can be kind. We'll get it wrong. We'll get it wrong so many times. Half of the Christian life is about falling flat on our face in the mud, and the other half is about Jesus washing us clean and bringing us back upright again. And we can get used to it. We will get it wrong. That is not a sign that we're some kind of bad Christian or God has given up on us. It is a sign that we are human fallen beings in a broken, fallen world. But the trajectory can still be in that direction. The trajectory can still be towards that love. And you know what? You can pray for each other. That person sitting next to you right now, 
I don't know whether they are a complete stranger or they are a, a, a best friend, but they are part of your family. And, and you can pray for each other today, right this second, probably not out loud, that would be weird. But you can do that. Lord, please help that person to go on that journey of fruitfulness, of love. In our church, let us be united. Pray for your churches to be increasingly loving, united places where people bear with each other. I mean, wouldn't that be a joy? In every meeting where something difficult is discussed, where we bear with each other and love each other and treat each other kindly. We get it wrong, but we we can shoot for more because Jesus is worth it. And we can know that the Holy Spirit is at work bringing that fruit. A friend of mine um, cross-stitched verses uh, 12 to 14 for me. At a time when I really wasn't showing any of those things particularly well. And years later, I still have it in my home. A reminder of what God is moving me towards. Of what God is moving all of us towards. And as we go on that journey, we can be fueled with worship and word in verse 16. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Now, all of us will be in churches where we have preachers and teachers teaching us And praise God for whoever is teaching you uh, week by week. But part of this journey towards wholeheartedness, part of this journey away from wibbling through taking off our old self and putting on our new towards the beauty of standing firm in the gospel is us rolling up our sleeves and teaching each other. People like me get to speak for half an hour once a year to you. You get to speak to each other every week, possibly every day. You can spur each other on. You can open scripture together. You can remind each other of these truths. It calls us to sing to each other too. I don't think that translates quite as well into the 21st century world as maybe some of the other uh, uh, suggestions do. Um, If I were to come up to you on Nottingham Station and start singing uh, Psalm 23 to you, you might think that's a little bit odd. But there is a sense in which when we're singing together, as we have been today and will continue to do later today, it's not just to God, it's to each other. We're speaking out those truths to remind each other of what is right, of who God is, of how he loves us, of how we can follow him. It's a communal, corporate thing. And we can be committed to using our words. One of the pictures of of the Christian life that uh, I I love is of, of women and indeed men, but we're women mainly here today, women linking their arms and walking through the mud and mire of our lives with eyes fixed on Jesus and encouraging each other to keep going. And when they trip, one trips over, saying, come on, let's get back up. Let's try it again. When someone goes astray, going, come back. Jesus is worth it. When someone gets confused, saying, let's work it through, because God is good. When someone doubts, saying, it's okay to ask questions. Let's pray. You have an awesome responsibility to your sisters around you, not a burden. This isn't meant to be something that terrifies you and drags you down, but a wonderful opportunity to speak words of truth and hope and love and life and light into their lives. Don't keep quiet. Text it, Facebook it, Instagram it. Get out a pen and write it if you're desperate. I mean, how old school is that? But it's so beautiful to get a handwritten note. Put words of truth and words of praise into each other's mouths. And as we go on that journey, that old self off, new self on, fueled by the word and the worship in our hearts, as we have our eyes firmly fixed on Christ and who he is, we will discover that nothing is out of scope. Now, we're not going to read the rest of Colossians. There's a, a limited amount of time on a day like this. But as you go through the rest of Colossians, you will find words that show that this wholeheartedness plays out in every aspect of our lives. We've been looking mainly at verses 1 to 17, which is how it plays out in the Christian community. But in verses 18 to 21, we see how it works out in the home. In verses 22 to to 
verse 1 of chapter 4, how it works out in the workplace. Uh, Verses 2 to 4, how it works out in our prayer life. Verses 5 and 6, how it works out in our evangelism. Now, there's a bit of cultural uh, overcoming to do. Some of those things look a little bit odd to the 21st century eyes, but they are beautiful because they are God's ideas. And we can see that as we want to become more like Christ, its implications will reach into every aspect of our lives. There's no no no-go areas for the Holy Spirit. How we think, how we act, how we relate, every context will be impacted by this process of taking off our old, putting on our new, and going forward with wholeheartedness. And that's as it should be because he is Lord of all. There is no aspect of our life of which he is not rightfully king. But verse 17 ends where I would love all of us to end by reminding us that actually we're doing this because he's worth it. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You see, as we see who he is, his character, name in the Bible is often very associated with character as we see how wonderful he is, as we see what he's done, as we see, let our hearts be moved to thankfulness by all he has achieved, then we can see that this wholehearted life is possible and worth it. It's not weird. It's not overwhelming. It's not too hard, even when we're exhausted. We, we will need to take baby steps. We we, we all all mess up. We will stumble and fall. But we can do it because he is doing it in us and he is worth it. Feeling wobbly? Aware that you are maybe leaning towards works or experience, division, being too sucked in by culture, believing your wayward heart, See that in your life? Well, come on with Paul. Come with Colossians. Come with Christ. Be passionate about having your eyes on him. Be committed to putting your old self to death. Be excited about living a new life that is honoring to Christ. And do so with hearts full of praise as we speak words of hope to one another. And if you do that, little by little, you will be able to live the wholehearted life, a life of rootedness in Christ that is beautiful beyond compare. Sisters, four brothers, be wholehearted. He is so worth it. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you that you have not just called us to this exciting life, but you've shown us the path. And thank you that you are enabling us to walk that path by your spirit each and every day. Father, please meet us where we're at. You know the sins, the struggles, the hardships we're facing. You know where we're limping. You know where we're rebelling. And I pray, Lord, you will take us on that journey. And over the next year, I pray that every single person in this room will become increasingly beautiful, increasingly wholehearted for you. And Lord, help us continue on that journey until that day when there is nothing but Christ and wholehearted worship of him left. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to commit ourselves to praying now, and what better song to go for than, Oh, Church Arise. We've been encouraged to go on a journey. I hope we've been galvanized to give it a go. So let's literally stand and stand with risen voices too and commit ourselves to that journey that Christ calls us on.
to action um, that is after all we've heard and thought about this morning. Um, and I hope if you're watching online that you've been encouraged too. Um, if you are watching online, why not send us uh, a Facebook message or, or post a picture um, to show us how you've been enjoying Christmas this year. Uh, we're going to take a, a half hour break for lunch now, so we'll be starting back at, sorry, this one not working. Hello? Is this one working? Super. Um, so we are going to be starting um, back in half an hour, so one o'clock. Um, I, th I think Liz has already told you where you can get food. So Tesco's is across the way um, and Sainsbury's and McDonald's over the bridge. But let me just pray um, for our lunch together. Lord God, thank you for all we have been thinking about together this morning. As we have our lunch now, please bless our food to our bodies. And Father, may the, the word of Christ dwell um, among us richly and the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we'll see you at one o'clock. <laughs>